This evening, he returns to tell us his story. Here. Good evening. Good evening. Did not the Lord wake us up this morning? Good evening. Man, it is good to be back in court. It is good to be back in court after 10 years of not being here. But my visit in Cortland in 1844 changed my life. It set me on a path that has put me into contact with men of education, refinement, and manliness. But first, I bring you greetings from the freedom loving, the anti slave, the abolitionist city of Syracuse, New York. And I bring you greetings from the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church of Syracuse, New York, where I am both pastor and servant. I see some familiar faces in the audience this evening. But I see many who are not familiar to me, so you are not familiar with me. Let me take just a few minutes to tell you just a little bit about the man who stands before you this evening. I was introduced as the Reverend Jermaine Wesley Logan. But when I was born a slave in Man's Coles Creek, Tennessee, they didn't call the Reverend Jermaine Wesley. They called me John. Nothing more, nothing less. They called me John. Now, to tell you about myself, I must tell you about my mother. You see, my mother was a pure African woman with skin that was jet black and hair curled closely to her head. As I was a little boy growing up, my mother told me of her childhood to nurture me and to rock me free. My mother told me that when she was a little girl, she remembered living free in the free state of Ohio. She recalled that she lived with a Mr. McCoy. Now, she doesn't recall how she came to live with Mr. McCoy, or even how she came to live in the free state of Ohio. But she told me that she remembered living free in the free state of Ohio. My mother told me that when she was six or seven years of age, she remembers that a bad man came up to the McCoy residence, and she was playing out of eyesight and earshot of the residence. And the bad man, he jumped out of the wagon, and he grabbed my mother about his, her waist, and he put his hand over her mouth so that she could not scream. And he climbed back into the wagon, and he sat my mother on his waist. My mother told me that as her eyes adjusted, to the darkness of the way. She could see and she could hear other little colored children whimpering and crying in the back of the way. My mother told me that the bad man told the teamster driver to go home. And these two bad men, they drove that wagon and they crossed a river. And I believe to this day that it was the Ohio River. And after they crossed that river, they sold each one of those children for as much money as they could get. Eventually, my mother was sold to the Logue family, L-O-G-U-E, of Man's Cold Creek, Tennessee. The family consisted of the widowed mother and her three sons, Manasseh, Carnes, and David Logue. My mother told me, she was only six or seven years old, my mother told me that in her first interview with the Lord, they appeared to be kind.
kindly people. And they smiled at her. And she began to tell them, she began to plead with them that she wanted to go home. She wanted to go home. My mother told me that their smiles turned into frowns. And one of the loaves, and she doesn't remember which, but one of the loaves grabbed a whip off of the wall and began to beat her about her head and shoulders and began to curse her and told her that she should never again mention to anyone that she had been brought and sold to the Loeb family. And to seal this transaction, in freedom, in Ohio, my mother's name had been changed. But they told her from this day forward, your name shall be Cherry. Cherry. And she has been known by no other name since then. child made in the image and the likeness of God has been transformed, metamorphed over the years into a, a, a slave, into a thing, into chattel property by this demon that we call slavery. And that is why, that is why those of you who are, are abolitionists. Because we know that if we do not take this demon out of our country, it will destroy us if we do not destroy it. My mother grew into young woman, and her arms became strong, and she could do the work of any of the men on the bold plantation. But it wasn't that my mother could do the work of any man. And it wasn't that she became expert in making that good old Tennessee whiskey. <laughs> you see, the Lowe's, they ran a distillery. They had a still. And they drank as well as sold that good old Tennessee whiskey. But my mother, when she became a young woman, was taken. Not as the but as the mistress of the youngest of the Loeb brothers, David Loeb, and with him had three children. You see, David Loeb is my master, my owner, and my father. But I would not stand before you, ladies and gentlemen, this evening and tell you that while I resided with David, that I was meanly misused. No, <laughs> I slept in David's bed. I ate at David's table. I had free reign of the whole plantation. David took me hunting and fishing. I called David's mother Granny. And David and his mother Granny promised me, John, you shall never be sold. John, you shall never be meanly misused. John, you shall be set free when you are 21 years of age. But I ask you, what is a promise from a slave master to his property? And I answer, it is nothing. It is nothing. When David faced financial ruin, he sold all of his property, including his slaves. And he sold me, my mother, my brothers and sisters, to my uncle, Manasseh, who had moved to the southern part of Tennessee near the Tom Bigby River. He sold us to my uncle when I was 12, 13 years of age. Welcome. When I was sold to my uncle, I found out that they had become drunkards of the first class. They also made and sold that Tennessee whiskey. Their plantation near the Tom Bigby River was not much of a plantation at all. The slaves were meanly misused, and, and they raised very few crops. Mostly, they sold and drank that liquor. But it was on my uncle Manasseh's plantation that I was first used as a field hand. I was 13, 14 years of age. And, and I should say, 
I stand before you this evening not knowing the day I was born. Most slaves, they, they don't know when they were born because if the slave master told the slave when he was born or kept records of it, it would give them the idea that they could be human, that they were not property, that they were not slaves. So most of us who were born slaves, do, what is your date of birth? The date? The day of the year? <laughs> April 26th. And you celebrate that day each and every year. And it's a, it's a day of joyous happiness, correct? I have chosen February 5th to celebrate my birthday, to please myself. But I do not know the day that I came to this earth. That is the plot of a slave. As I said, when I moved to my own, when I was sold to my uncle Manasseh, it was the first time that I was used as a slave. And being big for my age, everybody thought that I could do a full day's work. And my mother, Cherry, she tried to teach me how to be a good field slave. But I, was, I remember when I was about 14 or 15 years of age, I was out in the field, and I was trying to hope, and I broke the hope. Manasseh, in a drunken rage, he picked up a rock, and he, he threw it at me, and I dodged the rock, and he cursed me, and he said, go fix the hole, it'll come back. So I went into the barn, and, and because I wanted to hurry up and get back into the field, I, I fixed it quickly. Well, I came back, and I, I started hoeing again, and, the, and the, the hole broke apart again. This time, instead of throwing something at me, he came upon me, and he picked up the stone part of the hole, and he took it, and he jammed it into my mouth. And he said, I will make you eat this. You, you, you no good. And he jammed it, and my mouth became bloody. And I turned over so that he couldn't jam it into my mouth anymore, and he began to pound it to the back of my head, and I almost lost consciousness. And he, he finally tired, and he walked away, cursing me to go get another drink. My mother wasn't in the field, but when she found out about this, she came to me, and, and she nurtured me, and she told me, John, this is what slavery is truly like. You will be abused. I made up my mind that come what may, I knew I was going to have my freedom or die in the attempt to obtain it. When I was 16 or 17 years old, an incident happened on Manassas plantation that is seared into my heart and mind. Manasseh had sent all of the women slaves out into the fields, and he had kept the children back. <coughs> now this was not common, but it was done. <coughs> After the women were out in the field, a group of slaves, little slave children, were brought upon the plantation by a slave dealer. And he and Manasseh, they talked. And Manasseh said, after they had reached their bargain, he lined up all of the children that had been held back. And he said, choose ye of these children, the ones that you want. The slave dealer, he, he went to each one of the children and he opened their mouths and he looked under their arms and he looked over their bodies with bruises or scars. And after his inspection, he chose two and they happened to be my youngest brother and sister. Manassas was paid his money, and the slave dealer, he took those slaves and he tied them to the coffle of slaves, and he began to move away from the plantation. And my youngest sister, she looked at me, and I looked at her, but there was nothing that I could do. And, and as she moved away, she began to cry. And her crying made the other children, who had not even been chosen to be sold away, began to cry. And, and the crying of the children alerted the women in the plantation, in the fields. And they came, and they saw 
that these children were going to be sold away. And my mother, she saw that her youngest two children were going to be sold away from slavery. And she went up to where they were, and she reached around both of them, and she grabbed them in a, in a, in a fair, a fair like, vice grip. And she, she held on to them, and she began to chant that you shan't take my children away. You shan't take my children away. The slave dealer, he looked at it, and he thought this was funny. And, and he began to say, leave them alone. And, and he said, he took out his whip, and he began to lash my mother's back, and lash her back, and her cloth was soaked with blood, and the blood was dripping down to the ground, but she still held on to those children. Her motherly love was so strong, she could not even feel those lashes, and she continued to say, you shan't take my children away. You shan't take my children away. The slave guy, he, he began to tire of this, and he took the butt of the whip, and he was good and ready to hit her on her head when Manasseh said, no, no, you will ruin her, and she'll be no good for anything. And he got two of the stoutest slaves on the plantation, and they attempted to Cry her arms away, but her love, her grip was so strong, even they couldn't do it. But one of them, he got a rod, and he put the rod down between her arms and the children, and he pried her arms away, and they grabbed her arms, and they dragged her into the barn. And they locked her down next to a loom so that she couldn't get away. And my youngest brother and sister were sold away, and I had never seen them again. Fear that I never will. My mother went into a deep stupor. She refused to work. She refused to eat. My sister Maria, my oldest sister Maria, she nursed her and another woman on the plantation. They nursed her. But it was months before my mother went back into the fields. And she has not been the same from that day to this day. My mother aches to this day for her children. I had made up my mind that I was going to have my fear. And the year that I turned 20 or 21 years of age, another incident took place on the Manassas plantation. My older sister Maria, she was a married woman with three children and a baby at her breast. When I came back from writing, I came upon the scene where Manassas had already sold her to a slave driver. And the slave driver, he was trying to pull her away, but she was yelling, no, no, if you, if you buy me, please buy my baby. Don't separate me from my child. Please let me nurse my baby. Let me stay with my baby. And she wouldn't go. And he's tried to pull her and pull her, but she wouldn't go. So finally, he got angry, and he took a fist, and he hit her on her mouth. And blood started dripping down her lip. That blow sent her into a stoop. And he picked her up, and he threw her into the wagon. And they drove away. And as she was driving away, I could still hear her murmuring. Please don't separate me from my child, my baby. Christmas Eve, that same year, me and my best friend, John Farney, we decided we were going to make our break for freedom or die. <laughs> I stole the Lord's finest man, Old Rock. And I mounted Rock and John Farney, he stole his master's best horse. And we had uh, Mr. Ross, who lived in the vicinity. He was a white man. But he also believed that a man's labor should be his own. So we gave him $10 each, and he wrote us out passes. And our plan was to go from Tennessee and make our way up to Ohio, acting as free men. Well, we made our way from the Tom Bigby River up to Nashville. And from Nashville, we made our way into Kentucky. And we got through Kentucky, but when we got to Indiana, because neither one of us could read or write. You see, I had learned my ABCs, but I didn't know how to read or write. We got lost. We were not geographers. And, and, and 
It was only because of Quakers. It was only because of the free colors in Indiana and Illinois. And only because of the Native Americans that we made it through that winter. And eventually, after the new year, we found ourselves in Detroit, Michigan. And we crossed over from Detroit into Windsor, Canada. And when I knew that I was in Canada, where no man could lay claim on my body, I knelt and I kissed the ground. Because now I was truly free. No man could lay claim on my body. John Farney, he was with me, but he was so angry, he was so enraged. A, a, a livery man had kept his horse and his saddle, knowing that he was an escaped slave and figuring that he would not raise a fuss. But John said, I will go back and I will get my horse and my saddle or I shall die. I waited in Windsor three or four days and John never returned and I've never seen him. I couldn't find work in Windsor, so I went across the southern part of the Ontario province, and I finally found work in Hamilton, Canada. And I spent that first winter there with a kind family who paid me good wages for the work that I did. I stayed in Canada for three years, and I became a Bible scholar. I learned to read the book at a Methodist Sunday school. It was also in Canada that I chose the name that I am known by now. You see, in slavery, they called me John. So I simply elongated it to Charmaine. The Sunday school was ran by Methodists, so they imposed the name Wesley on me. My paternal surname is <coughs> L-O-G-U-E. So I add the N to please myself. I saved money and I bought property in St. Catharines, but I decided it was time to come back to the United States and try to help my other brethren that were still enslaved help do something to get them free. So I moved to Rochester, New York, and I worked at the Rochester Hotel, one of the finest hotels in this country, as a waiter, as a porter. But it was in Rochester that I met a man who saw something in me that I had not saw in myself, E.P. Rogers. And he encouraged me to the attend the Oneida Institute in Whitesboro, New York. And when I did, I came up under the venerable teacher, preacher, Mariah. And I learned that religion, true Christianity, was not a sham. True Christians love thy neighbors as themselves. True Christians believe that if you do something to someone else, there will be consequences to you. True Christians did not mouth the words. They lived the words. This is what the venerable Ryan Green taught me. It was at the United Institute that I also professed religion for the first time. And I joined the AME Zion Church in Utica, New York. In fact, it was in Utica, New York, I had become a Sunday school teacher myself. And I met the light of my life. Her name was Caroline Storm. She was visiting friends from her home in Busta, New York, visiting friends in Utica. And a romance commenced between the two of us. And in 1840, we were married at her father's home in Busta, New York. I moved back to Syracuse in 1841 and became licensed as a preacher in the AME Zion Church, founded by now my friend, the Reverend Thomas James. It was because of trying to help that church finished its building, that I went on a tour of the counties, the southern counties. And it was in Prattsburg, New York, that I first was asked to speak of my experiences as a slave. This was in 1843. Bishop Rowley happened to be in the audience of the AME Zion Church, 
and he heard me, and he said, Logan, we must have you at our church. And he stationed me at a church in Bath, New York, in Steuben County. And in 1843, I went to Bath. I was ordained a deacon, and I went to Bath, and I was ministering to a mixed congregation, small, but mixed. And I preached on Sundays, and I talked to the colored children and adults weekdays. It was because of that church, the building was not finished. So I decided to go to the other counties in New York. And it was because of that, one bright September morning, I found myself here in court walking the sidewalks. I had asked a couple of the ministers here in Portland, could I ask their congregations for donations to finish our church? And they had turned me down. Unbeknownst to me, two men, members of the Presbyterian Church, had been discussing the political and spiritual demise of the people here in Portland. This was September of 1844. When they saw me, they, they approached me, and they asked me if they could be of service to them. And I told them about me coming to Cortland to ask them for donations to finish my church. They said, if we can get you a hearing at the Presbyterian and Baptist churches, would you be willing to speak? They said, are you a slave? And I, I said, well, I spent 20 years of slavery in Tennessee. And they said, well, if we can get you a hearing, would you be willing to speak at 5 o'clock at the Baptist church? I agreed. And we went to the Presbyterian church that morning. And after the service, I made my plea, and I received a handsome donation. The same thing happened at the Baptist house. And because I had talked to the congregations, the call went out that I would be speaking at 5 o'clock at the Baptist house. House of the Spirit. I had meant when I got up from my chair to go up into the pulpit. But the Spirit came over me and I didn't make it to the pulpit. And I remember, this was 10 years ago now, but I remember it as if it was yesterday. I knelt between the altar and the people and I prayed. I thank the Lord, I thank the Lord for bringing me out of bondage. And I ask that if it was the Lord's will that my brethren would be free without bloodshed, then Lord, thy will be done. But Lord, if blood must flow, I pray, I ask, that it come quickly. I remember saying, how long, Lord, how long must my brothers remain slaves in these southern states? How long, Lord, must my mother, my sisters, my daughters be given to pollution? How long, Lord, you have seen the suffering of my mother, having her children took from her. You have seen the suffering of my sister separated from her children. How long, Lord, was these things go on? When I finished my prayer, I went into the pool and I apologized to those in the team. And I explained to them that I had only learned how to read when I was 23 or 24 years of age and that I was not very good at speaking in front of the large audience. I asked them, I asked them to have pity on my brother of the South. I told them that because we serve a right and justice God, you cannot hold my brother in the South in slavery without it demoralizing and dehumanizing you of the North. God is just. 
We are all made in the likeness and image of the God who sits high and looks low. If you do not vote, this abomination, this despotism called slavery away, blood will flow in our country. Perhaps it will come quickly. Perhaps not. But if you do not get rid of slavery, it will destroy it. That was 10 years ago. The citizens of Syracuse, after I had made my talk, they did me a great kindness. A good friend of mine now, John Thomas, was enlisted by the citizens by conscription to buy my mother out of slavery as a gift to me. A contract made between Manassas Lowe and Mr. Thomas of Portland. And Nathaniel Goodwin, he went down to Tennessee to bring my mother back to me in Syracuse. But when he got there, Manassas said, the talk is that John is behind this. Mr. Goodwin had been told, to be honest. And he said, yes, this will benefit John. Manassas said, it is a rule of a slave owner that you do not sell a slave to a slave. Meaning that because I had never purchased my freedom, because I had ran away and they still considered me their slave, their property, they refused to sell my mother to Mr. Goodman to bring back. I have said it Inside New York State, I have said it outside New York State. I feel no bond. No one owns my feelings, my heart, my body. No one. I will not pay any man any money to free myself. I am free because God made me free when he created me. I owe no man any money for my living. It costs me. My visit here in court 10 years ago now changed my life. I have come into contact with the Reverend Samuel Ringgold Bull, with Mr. John Thomas, who now lives in Syracuse and puts out the Carson Lee paper. I have come into contact with that model man of all model men, Mr. Garrett Smith, a philanthropist to his heart. But because I came here, I was able to return to Syracuse and help free a man from bondage with a vigilance committee in Syracuse. Because I came here, I have been appointed the depot manager of the Underground Railroad in Syracuse. They called me the king of the Underground Railroad. And I smile every time they do. But because of my visit here in Syracuse 10 years ago, I stand before you, the man that you hear this evening, free and unwilling to deal with anything that takes away my manhood. All men fight for freedom. All men shed blood for what they believe. 